uh, in that um, Ian Baldwin, uh, and I'm not saying this to flatter him because uh, he's not even here, um, Ian Baldwin jumped into, or jumped into a very difficult situation. Not only did he not know he was teaching this course until about a week before it was happening, um, but the course he was asked to teach uh, had never been taught before uh, here or anywhere by him. So he basically created a whole course out of nothing uh, in the course of a week um, and pulled it off quite remarkably well. Um, and so you guys are very fortunate um, to have him uh, to be your teacher. Um, the same, second thing about this course is that uh, it's a very special course in that it's not your typical history course starting with the dawn of civilization to the present moment. And here's a bunch of slides. Memorize these dates and uh, names and places. Um, although sometimes it feels that way because there's always going to be some of that going on. But um, it is definitely not that. And so uh, I want to give you a little taste of what that feels like. So that should go away. Escape. And then I know where it is. It's over here. But we could do that. I mean, I've seen, um, that's the way um, often these lectures are. And uh, I hope none of you suffer from anxiety disorders um, in history classes like this when it goes like this. Um, let's pretend this is my actual lecture, OK? Just for her. She's going to be shocked. So. Um, in schools of architecture all over the country this year, uh, there are students like you sitting in a lecture hall, and they're getting lectures about everything jumbled together because all of a sudden, the accreditation criteria have added that you have to teach non-Western history of architecture. Well, we had a hard enough time teaching the history of architecture in the few semesters we get before we had to cover the entire planet and all time. So uh, taking that same approach, what was impossible becomes ridiculous. And so this is the kind of lecture that a lot of schools and a lot of students are getting, uh, where we go from, OK, in Southeast Asia, the river systems were a very important basis of uh, civilization. And often they carved the temples out of the, oh, then, then we have the Byzantine church and the Borobudur, the, fame, the largest Buddhist temple in the world. And the Chinese uh, house is very important in relation to that. Oh, we're back to carving temples out of stone. So, uh, and oh, we're running out of time, so we have to um, actually uh, do it a little bit faster. And so, are you getting all this? There's going to be a test next week, and you have to identify these slides. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. So, what's the point? Uh, history is not the record of all the events that have ever happened. You may have thought that's what it was, and we apologize for that. Actually, your high school teachers should apologize for that. History is actually the interpretation, the selective interpretation of things that have happened in the past. And so you are fortunate to be in a class where you're not, we don't, you don't have to do all that. You don't have to go through the la la, you know, it's not, it's not about that. Although sometimes it's going to seem that way, and this lecture is no exception. The point is, is that every, okay, there are four points, I think. Let's see if there are four points. Every uh, history course, the most important part of history is the second part of that word, story. That's what we do, we humans. That's what humans do. Since the dawn of time, even before there was language, we told each other's stories. Why do we do that? We do that because stories are useful. 
Stories help us understand who we are, what we're doing, where we're going, where we've been. Stories help us by giving us ideas that are useful. Uh, the story that we're told when we're young about hunting the antelope or going out and getting a job is useful. Uh, that's how we learn. And so since the dawn of time, we have told stories and we've done that because they are useful for conveying ideas, ideas that are useful. So unless you're telling a story that conveys useful ideas, don't bother. We don't want you to just memorize these facts of history. We're doing this for a reason. And at various points in history, architecture schools have tested the idea, you know, if history is like this, let's not teach history. And we're, about, we're heading into another experiment. A lot of schools are teaching less and less history. Hopefully, Wentworth is going the other way, um, doing a more and more effective job of teaching history, acknowledging that, that a lot of the courses we do teach are actually history courses, and then linking them together in productive ways. Uh, until Ian Baldwin took over this course, you were taught history in the first semester, then the second semester, and then we do it again in junior year, and you get a lot of the same material a second time around. Um, but we're starting to coordinate it and uh, help us out with that um, as you move on in the program. But we tell stories, we teach history because it's useful for what we do. Before we write, we learn how to read. And if you're going to write having never read, it's not going to be very good writing. Does that mean we want you to write exactly what you've read? Does that mean we want you to design buildings the same way you see them in history class? Absolutely not. That would be inappropriate. We want you to design in a way that is appropriate to contemporary conditions. But if you are going to have a shot at designing appropriately for contemporary conditions, it's useful for you to understand how previous generations designed for their conditions. So we tell the stories uh, that are useful today. That's why every generation uh, teaches history differently than the last generation. A hundred years from now, a hundred years from now, students like yourselves will be sitting in this class and they'll be talking about what we're doing today and they might tell the story, oh that was when uh, there was inexpensive and seemingly endless supplies of energy. That was the era, we, wouldn't, we won't call it modern architecture anymore, we will call it petroleum architecture. We might. Because that will be the best explanation for why architecture in the year 2011 looks so different from architecture in the year 2111. They'll say there was cheap oil and that's why they built their buildings and their cities that way. Nutty, huh? So uh, every generation has to reinterpret the history of past events according to what's happening at the present moment. And so we are currently in uh, the, the business of rewriting history of the past according to what is meaningful to us in the present. Which brings us to this lecture about cultural constructions. So um, when we design things, we are actually designing architecture that is a, a reflection of our present moment. We design, uh, but, and that's fairly well known, we understand that. Every history course talks about uh, the material culture and the evidence of material culture in our world as evidence of who we are, or what values and what meanings are important to that culture. For example, um, right now, uh, there are a bunch of architects all over the country designing and building office buildings and office parks. And they th don't think they're 
uh, telling a story. But in 100 years, historians will look, at, will look at that office park and will study it and will say, listen, back then when they built a concrete frame building with a steel and, curtain, steel and glass curtain wall, uh, that was the least expensive way to build a building. And the architects who are involved in building buildings, they think that's the reason they're doing this. There's no big story. But in 100 years, the historians will say, well, they were building buildings that way because of cheap energy and because the tax code said you can depreciate the value of new buildings for 10 years. And after that, uh, you better have recouped all of your investment in the building. And so every day beyond 10 years that a building still works is a waste of money. That's what the current business climate tells us. And so that's what historians will look at those ridiculously cheap office buildings. And they'll say, yeah, cheap oil, 10-year depreciation laws, that's why the building, that's why the architecture of that age looks the way it does. That's the story they will tell. And they will tell the bigger story, uh, this is what caused planetary death is cheap oil, 10-year depreciation. That's how we got in the mess we're in now in the year 2111. And so it will be a very different version of the story than the version uh, we're telling today, but has many things in common. The architects uh, who are working on it today are aware of the tax laws, and they're aware of cheap energy and what the implications of that are for the way we build buildings. So the story changes constantly over time. Buildings are, uh, so that's a way in which, that's a fairly routine uh, and uh, conventional view of history, that our buildings are actually a very direct expression of who we are, what is going on, what are our values, what is meaningful to us. And so we look back in time at a history of temple Borobudur in central Java. And we say, well, it's the largest Buddhist temple in the world. It was built in the 8th century uh, by devout uh, Buddhists. And they used it to uh, meditate and to experience uh, enlightenment at the top of the temple. And it does all these things. But Borobudur is an interesting example. It's not just a reflection of who they are. Borobudur is also an instrument for recreating meaning and value. So uh, it was used to extend and spread Buddhism to as many people as they could. And so every month, thousands of people would pil make a pilgrimage journey to Borobudur to uh, meditate and walk around its, its base and go to the top. So the two, those, this is really the two functions of architecture. It's a reflection. It's a reflection in a way, it's just an expression of who we are, but it's also a deliberate instrument for recreating something and expanding who we are. And it's that second function that is often neglected in architecture and in history in general. And so that's the one I would like you to uh, pay attention to most in the lecture that's coming. The first one was uh, architecture is a passive reflection, an expression of meaning, but it's also an instrument of expanding meaning, of extending meaning, of uh, making more people believe in it. In the case, uh, the obvious case of a, a Buddhist temple or a Christian church, uh, that it helps spread the word. Another example from religion are the Gothic cathedrals. Uh, the populations of Europe in the 12th and 13th century, they lived in very cheap wood structures with thatch roofs. They had rats living in the in the roof, it was stinky, and they cooked, and they did everything in one room. They cooked, slept, worked. Everything happened in a single room. And so imagine yourself living day to day in those conditions. Those are your normal conditions. And then you walk into Chartres Cathedral. How many people have visited a cathedral in Europe 
or, or here. This cathedral's here, I just like it. So what would it be like? So it's easier for you. What would it be like to exist day to day in this one room, thatched roof, rat infested uh, house? And that was just normal. And then on Sunday, you go to church and you enter this stone building that uh, there are stories that when people first entered uh, cathedrals for the first time, they had physical trauma because they, it was unlike anything they could have possibly ever experienced previously. And so they thought they had died and gone to heaven, which was the whole point. The cathedrals of Europe, the Christian cathedrals of Europe, were built that way in order to give people the experience of what it is like to go to heaven. The stained glass, the, uh, the incredible height of the ceiling, the light pouring in, the materiality, the, the acoustic experience, uh, just the visual experience, it was unprecedented in, most, in, in history and in, in people's experiences. And it truly was an instrument for convincing people that there was something very powerful at work here, and it was the Christian God. And so the Buddhist temple, the Christian cathedral, um, were both very clearly instruments for extending uh, the meanings that they were conveying. They weren't just passive reflections and expressions of meaning. They were instruments of reproducing the meaning. Um, and we're going to look at some examples that are also very explicit, direct uh, instruments of meaning. And hopefully what you will come away with is the ability to interpret the world we exist in here as both a reflection, not so hard. It used to be that the tallest buildings in Boston were churches. That's a reflection of a Christian society. Now the tallest buildings in Boston are office buildings. Um, okay, ditto. Also, an extension. Uh, it's, it's an expression of what's important to us now, money. Finance, the biggest, the tallest buildings are bank buildings. Uh, so it's, it is as it ever was in terms of that. Now what about the other part of it? What about architecture as an instrument for extending certain values and meanings. Um, there's a whole history of cities that I believe you'll be getting into in a few weeks that will certainly mention uh, how important it was after World War II for the United States to shift from being an urban-based society to a suburban society. And so the freeway network, uh, the mortgage loan acts, uh, the suburban house, um, mass construction, uh, the building systems uh, that were developed in order to cheaply build a vast uh, uh, fabric of suburban uh, sprawl outside of cities. It wasn't just uh, a reflection of who we are, it's also an instrument for creating a consumer society that shops at malls, spends money, and stimulates the economy. It was a machine for generating uh, for continuing the industrial machinery that had been mobilized for World War II. It broke us out of the Great Depression, uh, but we were at risk after World War II of slipping back into depression because all of a sudden we were shutting down all the factories producing tanks and airplanes and guns and bullets. Um, and so we had to uh, redeploy that industrial fabric to produce something else. History shows us that the thing we decided to, uh, to shift towards was the suburban construction that uh, boomed after World War II, which accounts for where we are now. So this is just another example. So um, to get even more specific about how this works, and um, one of the things you should notice that we're doing is um, this course is not just the history of architecture. It's those specific moments in history that reinforce an idea. And so I'm describing an idea, and we're going to look at points of reference throughout history. And we are looking at points of reference throughout history that reinforce that theme. 
And so what we're doing uh, is we're not just doing history the way, you know, with the slides flashing past at a mile a, mile a minute. Uh, we are doing history that is bound together by a specific idea. And starting in the 1970s, especially with the development of history at MIT, we started calling, we started using the term history theory. So it used to be we would study history pretending there was no theory. But every time you select one building and not another, you are using criteria, you are selecting moments in history based on an idea. Another word for idea is theory. So every history is informed by a theory, whether uh, the person performing that history is aware of it or not. So increasingly, we think of history as history theory, and that's really the uh, fundamental idea of this course, the way it's being taught, is that idea, the idea is the important thing. And that's what makes it relevant to what you do in the rest of the program and in the rest of your careers, is that these are ideas that your faculty have identified as being important. Even if the example we're looking at is from the 8th century and is located on the other side of the planet, you cannot get further away from this auditorium than Java. That's the furthest away you can go. It's right there. And so 8th century, other side of the planet, what does that have to do with what we do in this school, um, in studio? It has everything to do with what we do in school. Otherwise, we wouldn't study it. It's your job not to just remember the dates and uh, the floor plans and the architects and the locations. The prime, your primary obligation is to yourself as an architect and as a designer to understand what can be understood out of these materials. One of the most important, uh, the, one of the most clear articulations of how this works was uh, an article in 1985 by Nelson Goodman, who wrote uh, a piece called How Buildings Mean. So how does a building do what it does in terms of conveying meaning? How do buildings mean? He identified four ways that buildings mean. The first way is the most obvious way, is it just writes it right in the building. He used the Lincoln Memorial as his example. And so he said the first way that buildings mean is through denotation. It tells us in writing, in the building itself. And so the Lincoln Memorial is filled with denotations inscribed in the marble walls, uh, telling us what we're supposed to take away as the meaning of the building. So that one's easy, that was the obvious. Um, the second one is the one we care about in architecture. The second one, uh, Nelson Goodman called exemplification. So it exemplifies meaning. But the way you're going to talk about it at the end of uh, this year, um, you're going to get an assignment uh, for the summer. And uh, it's going to be, uh, you're supposed to read a book called Experiencing Architecture. This is one of the most important <laughs> books you will read, at least in the next year of your life. Uh, and you will carry it forward uh, because of the power of experience. And whenever you uh, do a drawing or build a model in studio, you will take a break, go to the bathroom, and come back, and you'll see there it is. There's your model and your drawing, and it will be your job to criticize what you just did. The most important way you are going to criticize everything you do in studio is you are going to imagine yourself experiencing that architecture. And based on your experience of that architecture, you will identify what works and doesn't work in what you have done. And then you will plan the next thing you're going to do. And when you present it at the end of the project, that's exactly what your critics are going to do. We have this magic pixie dust. We sprinkle it on ourselves. We shrink ourselves down, and we walk through 
the building that you have designed. We experience it. And based on our experience of your architectural proposal, we will criticize what you've done. So this is the big one. It's exemplification. So Nelson Goodman looked at the Lincoln Memorial, and he said, you don't have to read anything. You don't even have to be from this planet. If you walk up to this or float up to this, uh, you will be struck by the scale and the experience of awe. It will be inspiring. And so even without any knowledge of where you are or what it's supposed to mean, you will experience something, some emotional response. And it will change who you are. It will change the meaning of this for all time. And that is the main thing that we care about as architects. And it's what uh, Nelson Goodman called exemplification. What we are more likely to call experience. And when you get into the senior year or the graduate year, we'll start to talk about the phenomenology of architecture. It's still the same. It's a fancy pants word for the same thing. It's experience. And the whole city of Washington, DC, is designed and built in order to give you that experience of, wow, this guy sitting on that chair was an important guy. And so it's all, it's not just architectural scale exemplification and experience, it also happens at the urban scale. So the third way, and this used to be, in, when I was going to school, this was the big one. We didn't care so much about experience back then. We cared about metaphors and symbols. Uh, I'm happy to say we seem to have gotten over that. It's still important, but it's not nearly as important as it used to be. Um, so that's good news for you. But here's, and at various points in history, this was the big one. So here we see a, a symbolic language of the Greek columns. Where else do you see this symbolic language? Well, there it is. So it's all around us, the symbolic language. These guys in the fourth century BC developed a system of construction in wood and then they, uh, they decided wood rots, we're gonna build it out of stone and marble and uh, make it last forever, but we're not gonna change the form very much. So this is actually an adaptation of wood architecture into stone and it took, and, and basically we forget about its origins in, um, in wood construction. And all we think of now is big ideas like democracy or banks or trust. And so this is the symbolic language of our culture at this point. Uh, we use it in our buildings, especially buildings like the Lincoln Memorial, which is a replica of an architecture from 2,000 years prior to its construction. Uh, and we're still stuck in that same symbolic language, for better or worse, there it is. Um, and so, and there have been various points in history, the Renaissance, the 18th century, the rise of postmodernism in the 20th century, where all of a sudden the symbolic language becomes important again. So the third way was metaphor and symbolism. The fourth way happens outside of the boundaries of the buildings often. So the Lincoln Memorial is also important because we put it on our money. The Lincoln Memorial is also important because in 1963, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made a very famous speech there. And so every event that occurs in this sacred space, it's not just sacred because Lincoln and his life and what he did uh, in the 19th century. That sacredness is, not, is, is reinforced, renewed, and extended beyond anything Lincoln did because of the civil rights movement. And that continues to be one of the most important things about this architecture and this piece of the world 
is a, it is a sacredly charged space. Do you think the architect uh, and the quality of the architect's design had anything to do with this? A little. It was available and it was powerful enough to become a vehicle of subsequent meanings that were layered on top of it. And so that's what happens. We build our buildings and we go away and they take on meanings that might have nothing to do with our original intentions. And so the four ways, what are the four ways? Someone asked me at the end of the first version of this lecture. This version is so much better than the last version. Um, denotation is number one. Number two, exemplification. exemplification, that's right. What was three? I just forget three. Metaphor. And number four, what did we call it? What is it called? What was his word? Mediated reference. No wonder I forgot it. What the heck does that mean? The reference, the meaning is mediated by something else. I guess that's a useful term because now, how do you guys experience architecture? Do you like uh, Frank Gehry's Bilbao Museum? How do you know? Whether you like it or not, it's probably because it, you experienced it through mediated reference. You experienced it in photos or on the internet or in YouTube between crazy cat videos. So, uh, so mediated references are increasingly important in the age of the internet. Here's one for you. Here's what it looked like when it was being proposed. And it had a certain set of meanings that were very much a, a reflection of who we were. The Port Authority of New York said, and Rockefeller said, hey, we need a big money development project in lower Manhattan to stimulate the economy and to become a symbol of New York in this uh, age. We're kind of losing, we lost our port to Newark, New Jersey, but we have to become meaningful in another way. Let's create this symbol and let's make a lot of uh, space for the financial markets. And so Yamasaki, uh, one of the architects, architects love to hate, uh, did this. And most people hated it. It arguably had bankrupted the city of New York uh, in the 1970s and uh, destroyed a big part of lower Manhattan. Um, and yet it got built anyway. And we architects kind of ignored it for a long time. And so it, had, it was a reflection of certain political and financial decisions in the 1970s. Um, it reflected an ethos and a technology of construction and the business of construction at the time. Um, there's certainly a lot of inscriptions, so there's denotation, there's, uh, there's exemplification, Wow, that's big, especially if you walked between the two towers. There was this huge gap between them that really inspired this experience of, wow, very tall. It was the tallest, two tallest buildings in the world uh, for some time. Um, but there was also a metaphor, uh, a, a symbolic language of progress and looking forward, the modern style. But then what happened? after that is really an example of the mediated reference, that it became a symbol of global finance and then uh, a target, uh, again, um, a target, a physical target that uh, exemplified uh, or symbolized global finance and thus became a target. And so since then, the meaning of the Twin Towers has completely changed way beyond its original architectural significance. So much so that when uh, the discussions occurred of what to do, even people who hated these two towers uh, when they still existed argued in favor of rebuilding them because of what it would mean. So imagine their argument, I hated this building when it was there, but let's rebuild it. 
because of what it means. So now we have this, and uh, so all of those stories around the World Trade Center are now pulled together, embedded in this architecture, and now this will start its journey. It has clear denotation. Uh, the names of the victims are inscribed in stone. Uh, there are inscriptions honoring the victims of that day. Uh, so there's plenty of denotation. There's exemplification. If you didn't know anything about this and stumbled upon it, uh, you would notice that this is something powerful and you would be emotionally moved by the experience of all of this water and falling down this endless black hole. There is metaphor. Um, the metaphor uh, of the footprint of one of the towers and the metaphor of the bottomless hole into which the water falls like our sorrow, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of symbolic stuff going on. But then starts the process of the fourth way meaning, buildings mean through mediated reference Every year there will be a ceremony. This will be highlighted. It will be in the backdrop of the cable TV news shots. People will get married here. Uh, if there are future terrorist attacks, this might become a target of that. So uh, the mediated reference is something that just continues. The architecture is either able, capable of supporting that in the long term, or it's incapable. It's a flimsy. Uh, flimsy not physically, but flimsy in terms of its capacity for carrying meaning. And so we see that approach um, all the time. This is the most contemporary example I have to show you. Um, the city of Medellin, Colombia uh, was the murder capital of the world uh, because of its drug cartels. And uh, uh, the 14-year-olds that went off to fight the drug wars, they were trained in how to shoot, but they couldn't read, but they could shoot really well, and they had a machine gun. Um, in the 90s, as the drug cartels moved out of the cities and moved into the countryside and then uh, started to demilitarize, those 14-year-olds came back to town, but now they were 30-year-olds. They still couldn't read, and they still had their machine gun. So they're probably not going to get a job working for a software developer. They're probably not going to stand behind a counter in an electronics store or a market for minimum wage. They're going to use their skills that they've been practicing for their entire adult lives to make money and put food on their tables at home. So the mayor of Medellin had to do something serious. And so he said, OK, I'm not going to steal your money. And so that gave him $400 million all of a sudden. Just by stopping the theft of tax money, that gave him a budget of $400 million. And he said, I'm going to build beautiful architecture. I'm going to prove to you that I'm serious about changing the social fabric of the city. So he built, uh, just like Bill Bao, uh, just like Frank Gehry and Bill Bao, he built a beautiful world-class set of cultural icons. Beautiful, you know, la la, you either like it or you don't. But the weird thing is, he didn't put it downtown. He looked at the map that showed where all the dead bodies were being found. He blurred his eyes, and he looked where the most bodies were found in the last few years. And he said, OK, wherever the most dead people or corpses were found, that's where we're going to build the world-class library cultural center park. And that's what he did. And he said, this is for the people of Medellin, not the rich people. It's for the people. It's for the poorest people. It's for the people who need it the most. And so and it wasn't just architecture. Architecture cannot transform society. I'm sorry. but." It would be difficult to transform society without powerful exemplifications and symbolic uh, acts that can only really be convincing if they take physical form like this. So you see a world-class library, cultural center, um, the best mass transit system they could figure out to go up and down these slopes. 
And these people, they don't care that they live in shanties that they built themselves. They have the best damn library cultural center anybody's ever seen. And now, by doing this uh, several times, they built several hundred schools, renovating several hundred others. They built five library parks like this, and they transformed the mass transit system in Medellin, Colombia. And now it's one of the most wonderful cities in Latin America. Their tourist business is booming. It's the hot spot of Latin America. Architecture cannot do it alone, but it's hard to do it without architecture. And that's something, this is a lesson from recent history, but it's there to be found throughout history. And so the way we tell history can often influence how we act in the present. And so in the 18th century, uh, an architectural historian said, the big argument of the day was, uh, should buildings be classical or should they be Gothic? And so there was a lot of, uh, especially in the schools, there'd be one side saying classical, all architecture should be classical. And then the other side said, all architecture should be Gothic, classical, Gothic, classical. So it's very boring. So the historians got involved and they said, look, I can prove that classical is the right way. And so they went back to Vitruvius. You've heard of Vitruvius? He was the first author who wrote about architecture. He wrote the 10 books of architecture in the Roman era. And they said, we're gonna go back to the start of architecture, Vitruvius. Vitruvius wrote about the primitive hut and he was basically telling a story about the first building. He said, in the beginning, man needed shelter. And so he used nature to create shelter, the first primitive hut. When you draw it like this, it demonstrates that from the dawn of time, architecture has been classical. Because how else would you build a primitive hut other than using the classical uh, arrangement of columns, beams, and a, a pediment roof? Well, guess what? The competition said, no, 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 no. That's not the first primitive hut. I'm a historian. I can tell you the story of the first primitive hut. It, they took trees and they bent them together to meet at the middle. It was Gothic, see? And so this is an example of how history uh, is used in the contemporary context to make an argument to inform what we should build, how we should design. Here's a weird one. If, you've, if you know anything about history, you will recognize, if you've gone through the classical history of uh, architecture, you'll say, oh look, there's a replica of the Acropolis in Greece, in Athens, Greece. But wait, what's that? Oh, I recognize that. That's the ruin of the Colosseum in Rome. Greece, Rome, we often see those words together, but they're located several centuries and several hundred miles apart. So what's going on here? This is the redeployment of history, especially in the metaphorical symbolic sense, in order to achieve some goal in the present day. So what's going on here? A French chateau, not so strange, but it's in China. And it's not a chateau, uh, it's, a, it's a luxury multifamily dwelling. Why are they building new multifamily apartment houses to look like a French chateau in China? What's this? Oh, it looks, looks like a regular old kitchen. Well, the interesting thing about this kitchen is that there are two kitchens. One where the food is made, and then this one. Where the food is made is off to the right, out of this picture, through a doorway. It's a very dark room with a fluorescent light bulb, no windows, a concrete floor, no countertops, no table. The, the servants who cook this wonderful food, the best food you can get anywhere, they squat on the ground and crush up peppers and tofu and tempeh and all kinds of coconut milk stuff. And they make this wonderful 
food, and they do it in that concrete room, squatting on the ground, cooking on a propane stove. This is the kitchen for the family. When guests come, you get soda out of the luxury refrigerator and chips out of the cabinet, and that's really all that happens in this kitchen. This is the show kitchen. The real cooking kitchen goes on over there. What's going on with that? Rodeo Drive. How many people have been to Hollywood and Rodeo Drive? OK. So here we are on Rodeo Drive, but no wait. That doesn't look like Los Angeles. And what's that weird language down there? Hey, that's not Rodeo Drive. But why are they trying to make it look as if it were Rodeo Drive? What's going on here? So this is, these are examples of what's going on in the developing world uh, all over the place now. Students who study the history of architecture in Shanghai, in Saigon, or Ho Chi Minh City, in uh, Manila, in uh, Dar es Salaam, all over the world, history of architecture is taught as the history of Western architecture. North America might be the only place that teaches the history of architecture as a global history of architecture. Uh, and those students are graduating and going to work for real estate developers. And the real estate developers say, we want a replica of Western historical architecture because that's what sells real estate. It's a very strange situation. Um, and these are cultural constructions. They are designs intended to present a, a message and a set of meanings that offer to people who buy luxury houses in these developments. And I should be showing that. The people who are buying real estate in these gated communities are buying it because it helps them feel like um, I'm connected with those Americans. I'm not just watching Baywatch and CSI, and I don't even know what's on TV these days. Your favorite shows. I'm not just watching those shows. Uh, I'm living that life. I can be like those detectives in CSI, drive cars fast, shoot people, and uh, dress promiscuously, even though it's a Muslim culture. We still venerate that um, in our cultural constructions. So this is not new. Uh, the cultural construction of places around the world, according to imported ideas, has always been what happens. This is not, when we hear the word globalization, you say, oh yeah, globalization, that thing that happened in the 90s and is about to come to a close. But in the meantime, this is all about the whole world becoming one small uh, unified global culture. Well, that's the way it's been happening for, in the examples I'm showing here, at least since, at least for 2,000 years. Um, and so we're only going back to the 1920s in this next set of slides. In the 1920s, the Dutch, who have this tiny little country in Europe, also had this vast empire in Southeast Asia. All the islands surrounding uh, Java, every island between uh, Thailand and Australia, and all those islands, that was part of the Dutch colonial empire. And they had criminally stolen the money and food and resources for hundreds of years um, from the indigenous peoples of this area. And in the year 1900, they said, enough. Someone wrote a book, it was a story that ended colonialism in a way, at least that's what they say. A very powerful story was written up in a book and the Dutch citizens said, we have to stop this criminal activity. We have to honor and support and spread the benefits of everything we do to the people of Java and the surrounding islands. And so in that context, 
architecture came to Java for the first time. And the best architecture the Dutch had to offer was uh, the uh, Art Deco styles um, that were being tested out in the Netherlands at the time and throughout Europe. And a big debate um, came up. Should this be Dutch imposition of its culture on its co colonized Javanese uh, citizens? Or should we honor what the Javanese have done throughout history? Or should we do both? Should we bring Javanese culture and Dutch culture together and marry them just as um, the, the people have been, had been doing for several hundred years, having beautiful children um, of mixed race? And so uh, that was the analogy and that was the debate. One side said, listen, we looked at the history of Javanese architecture and there ain't nothing there worth, worth taking forward. It's all wooden shacks that rot in the tropical heat. They couldn't build a proper building if their lives depended on it. Um, and then there was another side that said, no, the Javanese culture is a classical culture that's been continuously flourishing for thousands of years. Some of the greatest achievements of classical music, uh, performing arts, dance, etc., and literature have all been flourishing. This is a golden age of Javanese culture in the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries, and they, the architecture should be no different. But no one really knew. No one really understood the Javanese architecture. And so, um, so this architect, Wolf Schumacher, said, hey, there ain't nothing worth extending from Java. Let's venerate the classical traditions as exemplified by the Buddhist temple of Borobudur, the Hindu temple of Prambanan, and the other ancient civilizations, such as, in this case, the Mayans. Wait a minute, what do the Mayans have to do with the people of Java? Nothing. But it's a very nice culture to emulate, and let's do it here in Java. Um, and so they did. And so the other side of the argument that was trying to make some case for honoring Javanese architecture, they basically lost that round of the argument. But he didn't give up. Uh, he went off to do research, and um, here's what he found. He found that this is a recent uh, depiction of population densities in this part of Asia. East, South, and Southeast Asia. In South Asia, you have a very high population density uh, in parts of India and uh, the coastal areas of China. And that's the way it was 2,000 years ago in the first centuries of the Common Era. They also uh, were highly sophisticated cultures in India and China that were producing goods and, and uh, that were, uh, they wanted to trade. And so it was very difficult to trade over the Himalayas. And so they found sea trade to be much easier. And of course, they used sailboats. For six months of the year, you could sail from India and get this far, but you couldn't sail this far. So you had to stop and wait it out for a few months until the winds shifted. And then you could sail to China and trade, trade your Indian goods for Chinese goods before starting on the trip back. At the same time, the Chinese traders wanted to trade with India and make profit on this trade as well. And so part of the year, they could sail from China and they could get this far. But the winds were coming out of India and they couldn't get any further, so they had to wait for a few months before they sailed onto India. So what happened here in the, on the island of Java where they had also had a very high population, a very sophisticated uh, civilization? That became the mixing bowl of the two great civilizations of the first millennia of the Common Era, India and China, primarily through the religions of Confucianism and Hinduism and Buddhism. And so Java became the site of these vast temple complexes. This is the Hindu temple Prambanan. And, um, this is uh, a Buddhist temple. This is the largest Buddhist temple in the world, 
called Borobudur, and I've, I was mentioning it earlier in your lecture. Um, Borobudur is a very interesting example of all the things we've been talking about. There's denotation um, on these lower levels of the temple. The walls are inscribed not with words, but with pictures that tell a story. They tell the story of Buddha's life. And so it's filled with denotation through pictures. It's also uh, an experience uh, unlike any other. One of the great uh, activities of Buddhism is, med is walking meditation. And so uh, pilgrims who would come to the Borobudur Buddhist temple would climb the steps to the first level and they would walk, actually in a clockwise direction, they would walk around the base of each level. And it took several hours of walking meditation uh, to complete the journey. And so it was an instrument for meditation. It was uh, a storytelling device also. You could stop and sit and ponder the story of Buddha's life that depicted on the panels. Several hundred uh, different panels uh, depicting the different events in Buddha's life. And then after, at the end of the journey, you finally rise up to this level where all of a sudden the cacophony of everything below and the restricted view of the architecture opened up to the countryside and the valleys. And all of a sudden you had this experience of release and uh, it, was the, it was intended to replicate the experience of enlightenment itself. And so uh, it was an experience, it, it, was, it used number one, denotation, it used number two, experience, number three, it used symbolism uh, because of the stupa form, uh, the, it housed the statues of the Buddha at the top, uh, that's what the stupa is for, is to uh, house the statue of the Buddha and um, there are more statues of Buddhas in e each of these than uh, any other place. Uh, and so there's plenty of metaphor as well. And then there's the, um, the mediated reference of history. This temple was built in the eighth century. The kingdom that built it converted to Hinduism, then to Islam. And so there was no supporting community of Buddhists. And so the jungle took it over. And it wasn't until Sir Thomas uh, Raffles, Stanford Raffles, became governor of Java under the British that he sent an expedition and he rediscovered this temple buried uh, in the forest. And so it was restored, rebuilt uh, during, Dutch, uh, during the British rule, and then restored again in the 1980s with international funding. And now it's um, one of the most popular tourist destinations in Southeast Asia. I was fortunate to live uh, not far from here for four years and visit it very often. Um, so after Buddhism died out, Hinduism became, yes, question. It, um, I think the question is when they restored it, did they keep it the way it was? It is still a Buddhist temple, and there is a Buddhist community, a monastery right down the street. The only thing they changed is that they were not capable of maintaining that uh, central space in the largest stupa. And so they just filled it in solid, which was an unfortunate loss. So after Buddhism rose and fell on the island of Java, Hinduism came in to the point where um, uh, historians for a long time thought that, the, that India colonized Java and made it a colony and forced them to adopt all of the customs and language and practices and architecture of India. But that's not true. It's just the Javanese loved everything Indian. It, they were the Hollywood of their day. Everybody loved them and wanted to be more like uh, the Hindus from India. At the same time, all this trade with China was exerting huge influences on every part of Java, culturally, architecturally. But the Javanese didn't really like the Chinese. And so 
they denied in the stories they told, in the histories they told. They said, oh, no, no, we've always done that. And sometimes they even said, the Chinese got that from us. Not true. The Javanese were, al were almost equally influenced by the Chinese and the, the Hindu uh, cultures of India, but they just denied any connection with China and embraced all the connections with India. And so that explains why so much of the architecture became uh, of direct emulation of uh, what you see in India still today. And so um, this architecture was completely uh, adapted from India to Java and became the basis of the Hindu Javanese religion. That nowadays we only see this in Bali, the small island off the coast of Java. And the reason is because the next culture came in, the next global culture that moved into Java was Islam. When Islam moved in, uh, it was also adapted. They actually took the sacred forms of Hinduism and that became the form of the first Javanese mosque and every Javanese mosque after that. And so the form of Islam, Muslim mosques in Java are housed in the architectural form of Hindu Javanese uh, architecture. But a little bit about China. The Chinese tradition of construction is based on the geometry of a three by three grid. And so the cities, the building complexes, and the buildings themselves are all based on this geometric form of the tic-tac-toe grid, sometimes interpreted and shifted as in the, um, the uh, forbidden city, uh, but often just as a three by three grid. And so it's a very powerful geometric pattern that is filled with cosmic religious belief uh, that is the essence of the Chinese belief system. Uh, and so the architecture is itself an instrument of religious devotion and practice. It, the architecture itself, and the, up to and including the form of its cities, are an instrument for uh, reproducing the knowledge and the belief system of the religions. This is true in Chinese architecture. It's also true in uh, Indian architecture. And thus, it became true in Javanese architecture. Um, and so we see the Chinese bracket being interpreted with uh, Hindu uh, decorative motifs as interpreted by Javanese craftsmen, uh, all existing within the first Muslim mosque uh, in Java. And you see things like porcelain plates uh, being embedded in the walls because they were very valuable. And so the mosque is, is actually exemplifying its uh, wealth and importance by doing what the Chinese do, which is embed uh, expensive plates from Europe into its walls. So you get this uh, bizarre and complex mixing of cultures in even something like a sacred uh, mosque. And so here we see some of the early Javanese mosque forms that are completely uh, adaptations of the uh, Hindu Javanese uh, roof form. Here's the Hindu version and here's the, the mosque version, the Muslim version. And so this form actually uh, immediately is recognizable to all Indonesians as the form of the mosque. And Java is a very interesting place because, in a way, it continues to perform its rituals from several thousand years ago up to the present. And I had the uh, great privilege of uh, being the royal architect for the king of Java for several years in the 90s uh, in the uh, extension and restoration of the palace. This is a historic photo, but it's a historic photo from 2005 or 1995, I'm not sure which. Um, and so the palace complex is a direct extension of the temple complexes of India, which are built to serve as a model of the universe. 
And it's not just a reflection, as I started this lecture, it's not just a reflection of the universe and say, this is what the universe looks like. It is an instrument for altering events on Earth. So this um, is the top of a temple, but it's also, at the same time, considered to be the top of the central mountain at the center of the Hindu cosmological system. And that is arranged in a, this model of the temple complex extends to the scale of the city and to the, country, the surrounding countryside. And so this is um, the Indian holy city of Madurai, which is one of the more intact examples of the cosmologically uh, charged form of the architecture and the urbanism. And so it's not just a reflection of the belief system. It is an instrument for changing the events. So in order to encourage the fertility of the land and the women, uh, they take uh, these sacred objects and they parade them around the temple complex in a clockwise direction uh, one or more times a year in order to renew and free the flow of good fortune. Because good fortune comes from heaven, flows into the world through the center of the temple complex, and then out into the world beyond. And so here we see uh, that good fortune flowing from heaven into the center of the temple complex and the sacred city and out into the world beyond. And so every temple complex in every city was built not just as a reflection of those uh, stories and meanings, but as an instrument for getting that good fortune to flow in as quickly as possible to, to increase the wealth of the kingdom. And so the palace complex itself, now we're in Java, is a direct replica of that model and when something goes wrong, if a volcano erupts off in the northwest part of the kingdom, the king sends his priests over to the northwest corner of the palace, performs a ceremony, and the volcano magically calms down. If the crops fail because of uh, famine, over in the, in the eastern uh, end of the island of Java, the king sends his priests there. They put a lot of rice and sprinkle a lot of water and get things to grow. And the famine ends magically over at the other end of Java. So it's not just a reflection, it's an instrument. Uh, again, it looks like it might be 100 years old, uh, but this is 10 years old. And they still perform those rituals. And they perform those rituals with very strong belief that they still work. The king is simultaneously the head of the Hindu Javanese religion and the head of Islam. And they don't see that as being in conflict. It's all kind of work together, just like the cultural formations are all worked together in this slide. This is one of those sacred ceremonies. But uh, you see the palace was redone by a Dutch architect in the Baroque style. They're wearing fez uh, hats from the Middle East. They're wearing the traditional Javanese sarong um, wrapped around the waist, uh, a batik pattern that has its own symbolic system. They're wearing a tails coat jacket from Dutch colonial uh, officials, but they snipped off the tails so they could stick the Hindu sacred sword in their waist the way they're required to. So, and they're playing um, marching band music very poorly. Uh, it looks right, but it sounds horrible. So it's a complete cultural uh, hybridization of everything all mixed together. And the palace complex itself works the same way. So after doing all this research, the Dutch architect um, made a discovery. He discovered that these primitive, uh, these primitive temples of the Javanese are actually extremely sophisticated structural things. Um, and this is me checking on the details of that. Um, that these buildings, um, the, the 
Dutch engineers criticized these buildings because they clearly have no idea how structures work. You will soon learn that um, a, a beam that's oriented like this is very wobbly, but if you turn it up like that, it's much stronger. And the Dutch engineers pointed out that all the roof rafters were laid flat like this. They don't have a clue as to what they're doing. And so they used that evidence to dismiss Javanese architecture. Um, there's the explanation. You'll get that next year. Um, but here's the weird thing. This is what the Dutch architect discovered when he did his uh, research. Uh, he discovered that the um, he discovered that the Javanese temples are actually more like tents. That the upper roof is actually held in tension by the weight of the lower roof holding it down. And this was part of the religious cosmic system to, uh, to exemplify what was happening spiritually in the architecture. So not only was it not a mistake, it was a much more sophisticated set of structural acrobatics that the Dutch couldn't really appreciate. And so armed with this new knowledge, he was able to make a convincing argument so based on this argument, he went, um, he got a commission to build uh, the new engineering school at, um, in Bandung. And so he performed this marriage process. He brought together Dutch engineering of the trust, the timber trust, and he built it. And uh, for a roof, he brought together this tensile system of roof timbers and employed the curvature, the natural curvature that occurs uh, when you load a structure in that way in order to create this hybrid cultural formation that uh, is a beautiful marriage between the Dutch uh, engineering of the truss and the Javanese tradition of uh, using tension in the roof system in order to create specific forms. And so that's uh, you know, that was a cultural construction that was called for politically at that present moment in time where the Dutch colonial government required an exemplification of how the Dutch and the Javanese could marry, could intermarry and have beautiful children and extend this colonial arrangement into the future. Uh, the way history unfolded uh, did not allow that. Uh, colonialism ended with World War II, and now we have the country of Indonesia. Um, so that's the lecture. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, if you have questions, you can stay.